It must have been a job to carry me up those stairs. The doctor was doubting everything, but as the safest attitude he stuck to literal truth so far as his words conveyed it, yes. You are no lightweight. To himself he mused, how did he know there were stairs? He cannot know it, he was senseless. Therefore he must be guessing or inquiring. Harold went on, I suppose the castle is on high ground. Can you see far from the windows? I suppose we are up a good height. From the windows you can see all round the promontory. But we are not high up, that is, the room is not high from the ground, though the castle is from the sea. Harold asked again, his voice vibrating in the note of gladness, are we on the ground floor then? Yes. And I suppose the gardens are below us. Yes. The answer was given quickly, for a thought was floating through him. Why did this strong brave man, suddenly stricken blind, wish to know whether his windows were at a height? He was not surprised when his patient reaching out a hand rested it on his arm and said in an imploring tone. It should be moonlight, full moon two nights ago. Won't you pull up the blind and describe to me all you see? Tell me fully. Remember, I am blind. This somehow fixed the doctor's thought, suicide. But I must convey the inutility of such effort by inference, not falsity. Accordingly he began to describe the scene, from the very base of the wall, where below the balcony the great border was glorious with a mass of foliage plants, away to the distant sea, now bathed in the flood of moonlight. Harold asked question after question, the doctor replying accurately till he felt that the patient was building up a concrete idea of his surroundings near and far. Then he left him. He stood for a long time out in the passage thinking. He said to himself as he moved away, the poor fellow has some grim intention in his mind. I must not let him know that I suspect but tonight I will watch without his knowing it. Chapter Xxxiv, waiting Mr. Hilton telegraphed at once countermanding, for the present, the nurse for whom he had sent. That night, when the household had all retired, he came quietly to his patient's room, and entering noiselessly, sat silent in a far corner. There was no artificial right, the patient had to be kept in darkness. There was, however, a bright moonlight, sufficient light stole in through the edges of the blinds to allow him, when his eyes grew accustomed, to see what might happen. Harold lay quite still till the house was quiet. He had been thinking ever since he had ascertained the identity of Stephen. In his weakness and the paralyzing despair of his blindness all his former grief and apprehension had come back upon him in a great wave, veritably the tide of circumstances seemed to run hard against him. He had had no idea of forcing himself upon Stephen and yet here he was a guest in her house, without her knowledge or his own. She had saved his life by her energy and resource. Fortunately she did not as yet know him, the bandages, and his act in suppressing his voice, had so far protected him. But such could not last for long. He could not see to protect himself, 
and take precautions as need arose. And he knew well that Stephen's nature would not allow her to be satisfied without doing all that was possible to help one who had under her eyes made a great effort on behalf of others, and to whom there was the added bond that his life was due to her. In but a little time she must find out to whom she ministered. What then would happen? Her kindness was such that when she realized the blindness of her old friend she might so pity him that out of the depths of her pity she would forgive. She would take back all the past, and now that she knew of his old love for her, would perhaps be willing to marry him. Back flooded the old memory of her independence and her theory of sexual equality. If out of any selfish or mistaken idea she did not hesitate to ask a man to marry her, would it be likely that when the nobler and more heroic side of her nature spoke she would hesitate to a similar act in pursuance of her self-sacrifice? So it might be that she would either find herself once again flouted, or else married to a man she did not love. Such a catastrophe should not happen, whatever the cost to him. He would, blind as he was, steal away in the night and take himself out of her life, this time forever. Better the ingratitude of an unknown man, the saving of whose life was due to her, than the long dull routine of a spoiled life, which would otherwise be her unhappy lot. When once this idea had taken root in his mind he had taken such steps as had been open to him without endangering the secrecy of his motive. Thanks to his subtle questioning of the doctor, he now knew that his room was close to the ground, so that he would easily drop from the window and steal away without immediate danger of any restraining accident. If he could once get away he would be all right. There was a large sum to his credit in each of two London banks. He would manage somehow to find his way to London, even if he had to walk and beg his way. He felt that now in the silence of the night the time had come. Quietly he rose and felt his way to the door now and again stumbling and knocking against unknown obstacles in the manner of the recently blind. After each such noise he paused and listened. He felt as if the very walls had ears. When he reached the door he turned the key softly. Then he breathed more freely. He felt that he was at last alone and free to move without suspicion. Then began a great and arduous search, one that was infinitely difficult and exasperating, and full of pathos to the sympathetic man who watched him in silence. Mr. Hilton could not understand his movements as he felt his way about the room, opening drawers and armoires now and again stooping down and feeling along the floor. He did not betray his presence, however, but moved noiselessly away as the other approached. It was a hideously real game of blindman's buff, with perhaps a life as the forfeit. Harold went all over the room and at last sat down on the edge of his bed with a hollow suppressed groan that was full of pain. He had found his clothes, but realized that they were now but rags. He put on the clothes, and then for a long time sat quiet, rocking gently to and fro as one in pain, a figure of infinite woe. At last he roused himself. His mind was made up, the time for action had come. He groped his way towards the window looking south. 
The doctor, who had taken off his shoes, followed him with cat-like stealthiness. He easily threw open the window, for it was already partly open for ventilation. When Mr. Hilton saw him sit on the rail of the balcony and begin to raise his feet, getting ready to drop over, he rushed forward and seized him. Harold instinctively grappled with him, the habit of his Alaskan life amidst continual danger made in such a case action swift as thought. Mr. Hilton, with the single desire to prevent him from killing himself, threw himself backward and pulled Harold with him to the stone floor. Harold, as he held him in a grip of iron, thundered out forgetful in the excitement of the moment the hushed voice to which he had limited himself, What do you want, who are you? H.S.S. Sure. I am Mr. Hilton. Harold relaxed the rigor of his grasp but still held him firmly, How did you come here? I locked my door. I have been in the room a long time. I suspected something, and came to watch, to prevent your rash act. Rash act? How? Why, man, if you didn't kill, you would at least cripple yourself. How can I cripple myself when the flower bed is only a few feet below? There are other dangers for a man who, a man in your sad state. And, besides, have I no duty to prevent a suicide? Here a brilliant idea struck Harold. This man had evidently got some wrong impression, but it would serve to shield his real purpose. He would therefore encourage it. For the moment, of course, his purpose to escape unnoticed was foiled but he would wait, and in due time seize another opportunity. In a harder and more determined tone than he had yet used he said, I don't see what right you have to interfere. I shall kill myself if I like. Not whilst you are in my care. This was spoken with a resolution equal to his own. Then Mr. Hilton went on. More softly and with infinite compassion, moreover, I want to have a talk with you which may alter your views. Harold interrupted, still playing the game of hiding his real purpose, I shall do as I wish, as I intend. You are injuring yourself even now by standing in the draught of that open window. Your eyes will feel it before long. Are you mad? Harold felt a prick like a pin in his neck, and turned to seize his companion. He could not find him, and for a few moments stumbled through the dark, raging. It seemed a long time before he remembered anything. He had a sense of time lapsed, of dreamland thoughts and visions. Then gradually recollection came back. He tried to move, but found it impossible. His arms and legs were extended wide and were tied, he could feel the cord hurting his wrists and ankles as he moved. To him it was awful to be thus blind and helpless, and anger began to surge up. He heard the voice of Mr. Hilton close by him speaking in a calm, grave, sympathetic tone, My poor fellow, I hated to take such a step, but it was really necessary for your own safety. You are a man, and a brave one. Won't you listen to me for a few minutes? When you have heard what I have to say I shall release you. In the meantime I apologize for the outrage, as I dare say you consider it. 
Harold was reasonable, and he was now blind and helpless. Moreover, there was something in the doctor's voice that carried a sense of power with it. Go on. I shall listen. He compelled himself to quietude. The doctor saw, and realized that he was master of himself. There were some snips of scissors, and he was free. See, all I want is calm for a short time, and you have it. May I go on? Go on, said Harold, not without respect. The doctor after a pause spoke, my poor fellow, I want you to understand that I wish to help you to do all in my power to restore to you that which you seem to have lost. I can sympathize with your desire to quit life altogether now that the best part of it, sight, seems gone. I do not pretend to judge the actions of my fellows, and if you determine to carry out your purpose I shall not be able to prevent you forever. I shall not try to but you certainly shall not do so till you know what I know. I had wished to wait till I could be a little more certain before I took you into confidence with regard to my guessing as to the future. But your desire to destroy yourself forces my hand. Now let me tell you that there is a possibility of the removal of the cause of your purpose. What do you mean? gasped Harold. He was afraid to think outright and to the full what the other's words seemed to imply. I mean said the other solemnly, that there is a possibility, more than a possibility, that you may recover your sight. As he spoke there was a little break in his voice. He too was somewhat unnerved at the situation. Harold lay still. The whole universe seemed to sway, and then whirl round him in chaotic mass. Through it at length he seemed to hear the calm voice, at first I could not be sure of my surmise, for when I used the ophthalmoscope your suffering was too recent to disclose the cause I looked for. Now I am fairly sure of it. What I have since heard from you has convinced me, your having suffered from rheumatic fever, and the recrudescence of the rheumatic pain after your terrible experience of the fire and that long chilling swim with so seemingly hopeless an end to it, the symptoms which I have since noticed, though they have not been as enlightening to me as they might be. Your disease as I have diagnosed it, is an obscure one and not common. I have not before been able to study a case. All these things give me great hopes. Thank God. Thank God, the voice from the bed was now a whisper. Thank God, say I too. This that you suffer from is an acute form of inflammation of the optic nerve. It may of course end badly, in permanent loss of sight. But I hope, I believe, that in your case it will not be so. You are young, and you are immensely strong, not merely muscularly, but in constitution. I can see that you have been an athlete and no mean one either. All this will stand to you. But it will take time. It will need all your own help, all the calm restraint of your body and your mind. I am doing all that science knows, you must do the rest. He waited, giving time to the other to realize his ideas. Harold lay still for a long time before he spoke, Doctor. The voice was so strangely different that the other was more hopeful at once. 
he had feared opposition, or conflict of some kind. He answered as cheerily as he could, Yes. I am listening. You are a good fellow, and I am grateful to you, both for what you have done and what you have told me. I cannot say how grateful just yet, hope unmans me at present. But I think you deserve that I should tell you the truth. The other nodded, he forgot that the speaker could not see. I was not intending to commit suicide. Such an idea didn't even enter my head. To me, suicide is the resource of a coward. I have been in too many tight places to ever fear that. Then in the name of goodness why were you trying to get out of that window? I wanted to escape, to get away. In your shirt and trousers, and they are not over much. Without even slippers. A faint smile curled round the lips of the injured man. Hope was beginning to help already. Even that way. But man alive, you were going to your death. How could you expect to get away in such an outfit without being discovered? When you were missed the whole countryside would have been up, and even before the hue and cry the first person who saw you would have taken charge of you. I know. I know. I had thought of it all. But I was willing to chance it. I had my own reasons. He was silent a while. The doctor was silent too. Each man was thinking in his own way. Presently the doctor spoke, Look here, old chap. I don't want to pry into your secrets, but, won't you let me help you? I can hold my tongue. I want to help you. You have earned that wish from any man, and woman too who saw the burning ship and what you did to save those on board. There is nothing I would not do for you. Nothing. I don't ask you to tell me all, only enough for me to understand and help. I can see that you have some overpowering wish to get away. Some reason that I cannot fathom, certainly without a clue. You may trust me, I assure you. If you could look into my face, my eyes, you would understand. But, there. Take my hand. It may tell you something. Harold took the hand placed in his, and held it close. He pressed his other hand over it also as though the effect of the two hands would bring him double knowledge. It was infinitely pathetic to see him trying to make his untrained fingers do the duty of his trained eyes. But, trained or not, his hands had their instinct. Laying down gently the hand he held he said, turning his bandaged eyes in the direction of his companion, I shall trust you. Are we alone, absolutely alone? Absolutely. Have I your solemn promise that anything I say shall never go beyond yourself? I promise. I can swear, if it will make your mind more easy in the matter. What do you hold most sacred in the world? Harold had an odd thought. His question was its result. All told, I should think my profession. Perhaps it doesn't seem to you much to swear by, but it is all my world. But I have been brought up in honor, and you may trust my promise, as much as anything I could swear. All right. 
My reason for wanting to get away was because I knew Lady Delanoy. What? Then after a pause, I should have thought that was a reason for wanting to stay. She seems not only one of the most beautiful, but the sweetest woman I ever met. She is all that. And a thousand times more. Then why, pardon me? I cannot tell you all, but you must take it that my need to get away is imperative. After pondering a while Mr. Hilton said suddenly, I must ask your pardon again. Are you sure there is no mistake? Lady Delanoy is not married, has not been. She is Countess in her own right. It is quite a romance. She inherited from some old branch of more than 300 years ago. Again Harold smiled, he quite saw what the other meant. He answered gravely I understand. But it does not alter my opinion, my purpose. It is needful, absolutely and imperatively needful that I get away without her recognizing me, or knowing who I am. She does not know you now. She has not seen you yet. That is why I hope to get away in time, before she should recognize me. If I stay quiet and do all you wish, will you help me? I will. And what then? When I am well, if it should be so, I shall steal away, this time clothed and disappear out of her life without her knowing. She may think it ungrateful that one whom she has treated so well should behave so badly. But that can't be helped. It is the lesser evil of the two. And I must abet you. All right. I will do it though you must forgive me if you should ever hear that I have abused you and said bad things of you. It will have to be all in the day's work if I am not ultimately to give you away. I must take steps at once to keep her from seeing you. I shall have to invent some story, some new kind of dangerous disease, perhaps. I shall stay here and nurse you myself. Harold spoke in joyful gratitude, oh, you are good. But can you spare the time? How long will it all take? Some weeks. Perhaps. He paused as if thinking. Perhaps in a month's time I shall unbandage your eyes. You will then see, or... I understand. I shall be patient. In the morning Mr. Hilton in reporting to Lady Delanoy told her that he considered it would be necessary to keep his patient very quiet, both in mind and body. In the course of the conversation he said, anything which might upset him must be studiously avoided. He is not an easy patient to deal with, he doesn't like people to go near him. I think, therefore, it will be well if even you do not see him. He seems to have an odd distrust of people, especially of women. It may be that he is fretful in his blindness, which is in itself so trying to a strong man. But besides, the treatment is not calculated to have a very buoyant effect. It is apt to make a man fretful to lie in the dark, and know that he has to do so for indefinite weeks. Pile a carp in, and salicylate of soda, and mercury do not tend towards cheerfulness. Nor do blisters on the forehead add to the content of life. I quite understand, said Stephen, 
and I will be careful not to go near him till he is well. Please God. It may bring him back his sight. Thank you a thousand times for your determination to stay with him. So it was that for more than two weeks Harold was kept all alone. No one attended him but the doctor. He slept in the patient's room for the whole of the first week, and never had him out of sight for more than a few minutes at a time. He was then able to leave him alone for longer periods, and settled himself in the bedroom next to him. Every hour or two he would visit him. Occasionally he would be away for half a day, but never for more. Stephen rigidly observed the doctor's advice herself, and gave strict orders that his instructions were to be obeyed. Harold himself went through a period of mental suffering. It was agony to him to think of Stephen being so near at hand, and yet not to be able to see her, or even to hear her voice. All the pain of his loss of her affection seemed to crowd back on him, and with it the new need of escaping from her unknown. More than ever he felt it would not do that she should ever learn his identity. Her pity for him, and possibly her woman's regard for a man's effort in time of stress, might lead through the gates of her own self-sacrifice to his restoration to his old place in her affections. Nay, it could not be his old place for at the close of those days she had learned of his love for her. Chapter XXXV, A Cry The Third Week Had Nearly Elapsed, and as yet no one was allowed to see the patient. For a time Stephen was inclined to be chagrined. It is not pleasant to have even the most generous and benevolent intentions thwarted and she had set her mind on making much of this man whom fate and his own bravery had thrown athwart her life. But in these days Stephen was in some ways a changed woman. She had so much that she wished to forget and that she would have given worlds to recall, that she could not bear even to think of any militant or even questioning attitude. She even began to take herself to task more seriously than she had ever done with regard to social and conventional duties. When she found her house full of so many and so varied guests, it was borne in upon her that such a position as her own, with such consequent duties, called for the presence of some elder person of her own sex and of her own class. No better proof of Stephen's intellectual process and its result could be adduced than her first act of recognition, she summoned an elderly lady to live with her and matronize her house. This lady, the widow of a distant relation, complied with all the charted requirements of respectability, and had what to Stephen's eyes was a positive gift that of minding her own business and not interfering in any matter whatever. Lady Delanoy, she felt, was her own master and quite able to take care of herself. Her own presence was all that convention required. So she limited herself to this duty, with admirable result to all, herself included. After a few days Stephen would almost forget that she was present. Mr. Hilton kept bravely to his undertaking. He never gave even a hint of his hopes of the restoration of sight, and he was so assiduous in his attention that there arose no opportunity of accidental discovery of the secret. He knew that when the time did come he would find himself in a very unpleasant situation. 
want of confidence, and even of intentional deceit, might be attributed to him, and he would not be able to deny nor explain. He was, however, determined to stick to his word. If he could but save his patient's sight he would be satisfied. But to Stephen all the mystery seemed to grow out of its first shadowy importance into something real. There was coming to her a vague idea that she would do well not to manifest any concern, any anxiety, any curiosity. Instinct was at work, she was content to trust it, and wait. One for a noon she received by messenger a letter which interested her much. So much that at first she was unwilling to show it to anyone, and took it to her own boudoir to read over again in privacy. She had a sort of feeling of expectancy with regard to it, such as sensitive natures feel before a thunderstorm. The letter was natural enough in itself. It was dated that morning from Varilands, a neighbouring estate which marched with Lanoy to the south. My dear madam, will you pardon me a great liberty, and allow my little girl and me to come to see you today? I shall explain when we meet. When I say that we are Americans and have come 7,000 miles for the purpose, you will, I am sure, understand that it is no common interest which has brought us, and it will be the excuse for our eagerness. I should write you more fully, but as the matter is a confidential one I thought it would be better to speak. We shall be doubly grateful if you will have the kindness to see us alone. I write as a mother in making this appeal to your kindness, for my child, she is only a little over eight years old, has the matter so deeply in her heart that any disappointment or undue delay would I fear affect her health. We presume to take your kindness for granted and will call a little before twelve o'clock. I may perhaps say, in case you should feel any hesitation as to my bono fides, that my husband purchased some years ago this estate. We were to have come here to live in the early summer, but were kept in the west by some important business of his. Believe me, yours sincerely, Alice Stonehouse. Stephen had, of course, no hesitation as to receiving the lady. Even had there been objection, the curiosity she had in common with her kind would have swept difficulties aside. She gave orders that when Mrs. Stonehouse arrived with her daughter they were to be shown at once into the Mandarin drawing room. That they would probably stay for lunch. She would see them alone. A little before twelve o'clock Mrs. Stonehouse and Pearl arrived, and were shown into the room where Lady Delanoy awaited them. The high sun streaming in from the side, shone on her beautiful hair, making it look like living gold. When the Americans came in they were for an instant entranced by her beauty. One glance at Mrs. Stonehouse's sweet sympathetic face was enough to establish her in Stephen's good graces forever. As for Pearl, she was like one who has unexpectedly seen a fairy or a goddess. She had been keeping guardedly behind her mother, but on the instant she came out fearlessly into the open. Stephen advanced quickly and shook hands with Mrs. Stonehouse, saying heartily, I am so glad you have come. I am honored in being trusted. Thank you so much, Lady Delanoy. I felt that you would not mind, 
especially when you know why we came. Indeed I had no choice. Pearl insisted on it, and when Pearl is urgent, we who love her have all to give way. This is Pearl. In an instant Stephen was on her knees by the beautiful child. The red rosebud of a mouth was raised to her kiss, and the little arms went lovingly round her neck and clung to her. As the mother looked on delighted she thought she had never seen a more beautiful sight. The two faces so different, and yet with so much in common. The red hair and the flaxen, both tints of gold. The fine color of each heightened to a bright flush in their eagerness. Stephen was so little used to children, and yet loved them so, that all the womanhood in her, which is possible motherhood, went out in an instant to the lovely eager child. She felt the keenest pleasure when the little thing, having rubbed her silk-gloved palms over her face, and then holding her away so that she could see her many beauties, whispered in her ear, How pretty you are! You darling, whispered Stephen in reply. We must love each other very much, you and I. When the two ladies had sat down, Stephen holding Pearl in her lap, Mrs. Stonehouse said, I suppose you have wondered, Lady Delanoy, what has brought us here? Indeed I was very much interested. Then I had better tell you all from the beginning so that you may understand. She proceeded to give the details of the meeting with Mr. Robinson on the Scoriac. Of how Pearl took to him and insisted on making him her special friend of the terrible incident of her being swept overboard, and of the gallant rescue. Mrs. Stonehouse was much moved as she spoke. All that fearful time, of which the minutes had seemed years of agony, came back to her so vividly at times that she could hardly speak. Pearl listened to, all eagerness, but without fear. Stephen was greatly moved and held Pearl close to her all the time, as though protecting her. When the mother spoke of her feeling when she saw the brave man struggling up and down the giant waves, and now and again losing sight of him in the trough of the sea, she put out one hand and held the mother's with a grasp which vibrated in sympathy whilst the great tears welled over in her eyes and ran down her cheeks. Pearl, watching her keenly, said nothing, but taking her tiny cambric handkerchief from her pocket silently wiped the tears away, and clung all the tighter. It was her turn to protect now. Pearl's own time for tears came when her mother began to tell this new and sympathetic friend of how she became so much attached to her rescuer that when she knew he would not be coming to the west with them, but going off to the wildest region of the far north, her health became impaired, and that it was only when Mr. Robinson promised to come back to see her within three years that she was at all comforted. And how, ever since, she had held the man in her heart and thought of him every day, sleeping as well as waking, for he was a factor in her dreams. Stephen was more than ever moved, for the child's constancy touched her as well as her grief. She strained the little thing in her strong young arms, as though the fervency of her grasp would bring belief and comfort, as it did. She in her turn dried the other's eyes. Then Mrs. Stonehouse went on with her story, We were at Banff, high up in the Rockies, when we read of the burning and wrecking of the Dominion. It is, as you know, 
a Montreal boat of the Allen Line, so that naturally there was a full telegraphic report in all the Canadian papers. When we read of the brave man who swam ashore with the line and who was unable to reach the port but swam out across the bay, Pearl took it for granted that it must have been the man as she always called Mr. Robinson. When by the next paper we learned that the man's name was Robinson nothing would convince her that it was not her Mr. Robinson. My husband, I may tell you had firmly come to the same conclusion. He had ever since the rescue of our child always looked for any news from Alaska, whither he knew Mr. Robinson had gone. He learned that up away in the very far north a new gold field had been discovered by a man of the same name, and that a new town, Robinson City, began to grow up in the wilderness where the condition of life from the cold was a new experience to even the most hardy gold miners. Then we began to think that the young hero who had so gallantly saved our darling was meeting some of his reward. She paused, her voice breaking. Stephen was in a glow of holy feeling. Gladness, joy, gratitude enthusiasm, she knew not which. It all seemed like a noble dream which was coming true. Mrs. Stonehouse went on from Californian papers of last month we learned that Robinson, of Robinson City, had sailed for San Francisco, but had disappeared when the ship touched at Portland and then the whole chain of his identity seemed complete. Nothing would satisfy Pearl but that we should come at once to England and see the man who was wounded and blind, and do what we could for him. Her father could not then come himself, he had important work on hand which he could not leave without some preparation but he is following us and may be here at any time. And now, we want you to help us, Lady Delanoy. We are not sure yet of the identity of Mr. Robinson, but we shall know the instant we see him, or hear his voice. We have learned that he is still here. Won't you let us... Do let us see him as soon as ever you can. There was a pleading tone in her voice which alone would have moved Stephen, even had she not been wrought up already by the glowing fervour of her new friend. But she paused. She did not know what to say, how to tell them that as yet she herself knew nothing. She, too in the depths of her own heart knew, knew, that it was the same Robinson. And she also knew that both identities were one with another. The beating of her heart and the wild surging of her blood told her all. She was afraid to speak lest her voice should betray her. She could not even think. She would have to be alone for that. Mrs. Stonehouse, with the wisdom and power of age, waited, suspending judgment. But Pearl was in a fever of anxiety, she could imagine nothing which could keep her away from the man. But she saw that there was some difficulty, some cause of delay. So she too added her pleading. Putting her mouth close to Lady Delanoy's ear she whispered very faintly, very caressingly, What is your name? Your own name. Your very own name. Stephen, my darling. Oh, won't you let us see the man, Stephen, dear Stephen. I love him so, and I do so want to see him. It is ages till I see him. 
won't you let me? I shall be so good, Stephen. And she strained her closer in her little arms and kissed her all over face, cheeks and forehead and eyes and mouth wooingly. Stephen returned the embrace and the kisses, but remained silent a little longer. Then she found voice, I hardly know what to say. Believe me, I should, I shall, do all I can, but the fact is that I am not in authority. The doctor has taken him in charge and will not let anyone go near him, he will not even have a nurse, but watches and attends to him himself. He says it might be fatal if anything should occur to agitate him. Why? Even I am not allowed to see him. Haven't you seen him yet at all, ever, ever, Stephen, asked Pearl, all her timidity gone. Stephen smiled, a wan smile it was, as she answered, I saw him in the water, but it was too far away to distinguish. And it was only by firelight. Oh yes. I know said Pearl, Mother and Daddy told me how you had burned the house down to give him light. Didn't you want to see him more after that? I should. Stephen drew the impulsive child closer as she answered, Indeed I did, dear. But I had to think of what was good for him. I went to his room the next day when he was awake, and the doctor let me come in for only a moment. Well. What did you see? Didn't you know him? She forgot that the other did not know him from her point of view. But the question went through Stephen's heart like a sword. What would she not have given to have known him? What would she not give to know him now? She spoke mechanically, the room was quite dark. It is necessary, the doctor says, that he be kept in the dark. I saw only a big beard, partly burned away by the fire, and a great bandage which covered his eyes. Pearl's hold relaxed. She slipped like a kneel to the floor and ran over to her mother. Her new friend was all very well, but no one would do as well as mother when she was in trouble. Oh mother, mother. My Robinson had no beard. Her mother stroked her face comfortingly as she answered, But, my dear, it is more than two years since you saw him. Two years and three months, for it was in June that we crossed. How the date thrilled Stephen. It verified her assumption. Mrs. Stonehouse did not notice, but went on, his beard would have grown. Men wear beards up in the cold place where he was. Pearl kissed her, there was no need for words. Throwing herself again on Stephen's knees she went on with her questioning, but didn't you hear him? I heard very little, darling. He was very weak. It was only the morning after the wreck, and he spoke in a whisper. Then with an instinct of self-preservation she added, but how could I learn anything by hearing him when he was a stranger to me? I had never even heard of Mr. Robinson. As she was speaking she found her own ideas, the proofs of her own conviction growing. This was surely another link in the chain of proving that all three men were but one. But in such case Harold must know must have tried to hide his identity. She feared, with keen eyes upon her, to pursue the thought. 
but her blood began to grow cold and her brain to swim. With an effort she went on, even since then I have not been allowed to go near him. Of course I must obey orders. I am waiting as patiently as I can. But we must ask the doctor if he thinks his patient will see you, will let you see him, though he will not let me. This she added with a touch of what she felt, regret rather than bitterness. There was no room for bitterness in her full heart where Harold was concerned. Will you ask the doctor now? Pearl did not let grass grow under her feet. For answer Stephen rang the bell, and when a servant appeared asked, Is Mr. Hilton in the house? I think not, your ladyship. He said he was going over to Port Lanark. Shall I inquire if he left word at what time he would be back? If you please. The man returned in a few minutes with the butler, who said, Mr. Hilton said, your ladyship, that he expected to be back by one o'clock at latest. Please ask him on his arrival if he will kindly come here at once. Do not let us be disturbed until then. The butler bowed and withdrew. Now said Stephen, as we have to wait till our tyrant comes, won't you tell me all that went on after the man had left you? Pearl brightened up at once. Stephen would have given anything to get away even for a while. Beliefs and hopes and fears were surging up, till she felt choking. But the habit of her life, especially her life of the last two years, gave her self-control. And so she waited, trying with all her might to follow the child's prattle. After a long wait Pearl exclaimed, Oh! I do wish that doctor would come. I want to see the man. She was so restless, marching about the room, that Stephen said, Would you like to go out on the balcony, darling, of course if mother will let you. It is quite safe, I assure you, Mrs. Stonehouse. It is wide and open and is just above the flower borders, with a stone tail. You can see the road from it by which Mr. Hilton comes from Port Lanark. He will be riding. Pearl yielded at once to the diversion. It would at any rate be something to do, to watch. Stephen opened the French window and the child ran out on the balcony. When Stephen came back to her seat Mrs. Stonehouse said quietly, I am glad she is away for a few minutes. She has been overwrought, and I am always afraid for her. She is so sensitive. And after all she is only a baby. She is a darling, said Stephen impulsively, and she meant it. Mrs. Stonehouse smiled gratefully as she went on, I suppose you noticed what a hold on her imagination that episode of Molly Watford at the bank had. Mr. Stonehouse is, as perhaps you know, a very rich man. He has made his fortune himself and most honourably, and we are all very proud of him, and of it. So Pearl does not think of the money for itself. But the feeling was everything, she really loves Mr. Robinson, as indeed she ought. He has done so much for us that it would be a pride and a privilege for us to show our gratitude. My husband between ourselves, wanted to make him his partner. He tells me that, quite independent of our feeling towards him, 
he is just the man he wanted. And if indeed it was he who discovered the Alaskan gold field and organized and ruled Robinson City, it is a proof that Mr. Stonehouse's judgment was sound. Now he is injured, and blind, and our little Pearl loves him. If indeed he be the man we believe he is, then we may be able to do something which all his millions cannot buy. He will come to us, and be as a son to us, and a brother to Pearl. We will be his eyes, and nothing but love and patience will guide his footsteps. She paused, her mouth quivering, then she went on, If it is not our Mr. Robinson, then it will be our pleasure to do all that is necessary for his comfort. If he is a poor man he will never want. It will be a privilege to save so gallant a man from hardship. Here she came to a stop. Stephen too was glad of the pause, for the emotion which the words and their remembrances evoked was choking her. Had not Harold been as her own father's son? As her own brother? She turned away, fearing lest her face should betray her. All at once Mrs. Stonehouse started to her feet, her face suddenly white with fear for a cry had come to their ears. A cry which even Stephen knew as pearls. The mother ran to the window. The balcony was empty. She came back into the room, and, ran to the door. But on the instant a voice that both women knew was heard from without, Help there. Help, I say. The child has fainted. Is there no one there? And I am blind. Chapter XXXV Light Harold had been in a state of increasing restlessness. The month of waiting which Dr. Hilton had laid down for him seemed to wear away with extraordinary slowness. This was increased by the lack of companionship and further by the cutting off of even the little episodes usual to daily life. His patience, great as it was naturally and trained as it had been by the years of self-repression, was beginning to give way. Often and often there came over him a wild desire to tear off the irksome bandages and try for himself whether the hopes held out to him were being even partially justified. He was restrained only by the fear of perpetual blindness, which came over him in a sort of cold wave at each reaction. Time, too, added to his fear of discovery but he could not but think that his self-sought isolation must be a challenge to the curiosity of each and all who knew of it. And with all these disturbing causes came the main one, which never lessened but always grew, that whatever might happen Stephen would be further from him than ever. Look at the matter how he would turn it round in whatsoever possible or impossible way, he could see no relief to this gloomy conclusion. For it is in the nature of love that it creates or enlarges its own pain. If troubles or difficulties there be from natural causes, then it will exaggerate them into nightmare proportions. But if there be none, it will create them. Love is in fact the most serious thing that comes to man, where it exists all else seem as phantoms, or at best as actualities of lesser degree. During the better part of two years his troubles had but slept, and as nothing wakes the pangs of old love better than the sound of a voice, all the old acute pain of love and the agony that followed its denial were back with him. Surely he could never, 
never believe that Stephen did not mean what she had said to him that morning in the beech grove. All his new resolution not to hamper her with the burden of a blind and lonely-hearted man was back to the full. In such mood had he been that morning. He was additionally disturbed because the doctor had gone early to Port Lanark, and as he was the only person with whom he could talk, he clung to him with something of the helpless feeling of a frightened child to its nurse. The day being full of sunshine the window was open, and only the dark green blind which crackled and rustled with every passing breeze made the darkness of the room. Harold was dressed and lay on a sofa placed back in the room, where the few rays of light thus entering could not reach him. His eyes and forehead were bandaged as ever. For some days the doctor, who had his own reasons and his own purpose, had not taken them off, so the feeling of blind helplessness was doubly upon him. He knew he was blind and he knew also that if he were not he could not in his present condition see. All at once he started up awake. His hearing had in the weeks of darkness grown abnormally acute, and some trifling sound had recalled him to himself. It might have been inspiration, but he seemed to be conscious of some presence in the room. As he rose from the sofa, with the violent motion of a strong man startled into unconscious activity, he sent a shock of fear to the eager child who had strayed into the room through the open window. Had he presented a normal appearance, she would not have been frightened. She would have recognized his identity despite the changes and have sprung to him so impulsively that she would have been in his arms before she had time to think. But now all she saw was a great beard topped with a mass of linen and lint, which obscured all the rest of the face and seemed in the gloom like a gigantic and ominous turban. In her fright she screamed out. He in turn forgetful for the moment of his intention of silence, called aloud, Who is that? Pearl, who had been instinctively backing towards the window by which she had entered, and whose thoughts in her fright had gone back to her mother, refuge in time of danger, cried out, Mother, Mother! It is him! It is the man! She would have run towards him in spite of his forbidding appearance, but the shock had been too much for her. The little knees trembled and gave way, the brain reeled, and with a moan she sank on the floor in a swoon. Harold knew the voice the instant she spoke, there was no need for the enlightening words Pearl. Pearl, he cried. Come to me, darling. But as he spoke he heard her moan, and the soft thud of her little body on the thick carpet. He guessed the truth and groped his way towards where the sound had been, for he feared lest he might trample upon her in too great eagerness. Kneeling by her he touched her little feet, and then felt his way to her face. And as he did so, such is the double action of the mind, even in the midst of his care the remembrance swept across his mind of how he had once knelt in just such manner in an old church by another little senseless form. In his confusion of mind he lost the direction of the door, and coming to the window pushed forward the flapping blind and went out on the balcony. He knew from the freshness of the air and the distant sounds that he was in the open. This disturbed him, as he wished to find someone who could attend to the fainting child. 
but as he had lost the way back to the room now, he groped along the wall of the castle with one hand, whilst he held Pearl securely in the other. As he went he called out for help. When he came opposite the window of the Mandarin room Mrs. Stonehouse saw him, she ran to him and caught Pearl in her arms. She was so agitated, so lost in concern for the child that she never even thought to speak to the man whom she had come so far to seek. She wailed over the child, Pearl. Pearl. What is it? Darling. It is mother. She laid the girl on the sofa, and taking the flowers out of a glass began to sprinkle water on the child's face. Harold knew her voice and waited in patience. Presently the child sighed, the mother, relieved, thought of other things at last and looked around her. There was yet another trouble. There on the floor, where she had slipped down, lay Lady Delanoy in a swoon. She called out instinctively, forgetting for the moment that the man was blind, but feeling all the old confidence which he had won in her heart, oh! Mr. Robinson, help me! Lady Delanoy has fainted too, and I do not know what to do. As she spoke she looked up at him and remembered his blindness. But she had no time to alter her words. The instant she had spoken Harold, who had been leaning against the window sash, and whose mind was calmer since with his acute hearing he too had heard Pearl sigh, seemed to leap into the room. Where is she? Where is she? Oh, God, now am I blind indeed. It gave her a pang to hear him and to see him turn helplessly with his arms and hands outstretched as though he would feel for her in the air. Without pause, and under an instinctive and uncontrollable impulse, he tore the bandages from his eyes. The sun was streaming in. As he met it his eyes blinked and a cry burst from him, a wild cry whose joy and surprise pierced even through the shut portals of the swooning woman's brain. Not for worlds would she ever after have lost the memory of that sound, light, light. Oh, God. Oh, God. I am not blind. But he looked round him still in terrified wonder, where is she? Where is she? I cannot see her. Stephen. Stephen. Where are you? Mrs. Stonehouse, bewildered, pointed where Stephen's snow-white face and brilliant hair seemed in the streaming sunlight like ivory and gold, there there. He caught her arm mechanically, and putting his eyes to her wrist, tried to look along her pointed finger. In an instant he dropped her arm moaning. I cannot see her. What is it that is over me? This is worse than to be blind. He covered his face with his hands and sobbed. He felt light strong fingers on his forehead and hands, fingers whose touch he would have known had they been laid on him were he no longer quick. A voice whose music he had heard in his dreams for two long years said softly, I am here, Harold. I am here. Oh. Do not sob like that, it breaks my heart to hear you. He took his hands from his face and held hers in them, staring intently at her as though his passionate gaze would win through every obstacle. That moment he never forgot. Never could forget. 
He saw the room all rich in yellow. He saw Pearl, pale but glad-eyed, lying on a sofa holding the hand of her mother, who stood beside her. He saw the great high window open, the lines of the covered stone balcony without, the stretch of green sward all vivid in the sunshine, and beyond it the blue quivering sea. He saw all but that for which his very soul longed, without to see which sight itself was valueless. But still he looked, and looked, and Stephen saw in his dark eyes, though he could not see her, that which made her own eyes fill and the warm red glow on her face again. Then she raised her eyes again, and the gladness of her beating heart seemed the answer to his own. For as he looked he saw, as though emerging from a mist whose obscurity melted with each instant, what was to him the one face in all the world. He did not think then of its beauty, that would come later, and besides no beauty of one born of woman could outmatch the memorized beauty which had so long held his heart. But that he had so schooled himself in long months of gloomy despair, he would have taken her in his arms there and then, and, heedless of the presence of others, have poured out his full heart to her. Mrs. Stonehouse saw and understood. So too Pearl, who though a child was a woman child, softly they rose up to steal away. But Stephen saw them, her own instincts, too, told her that her hour had not come. What she hoped for must come alone. So she called to her guests, don't go. Don't go, Mrs. Stonehouse. You know now that Harold and I are old friends, though neither of us knew it, till this moment. We were brought up as almost as brother and sister. Pearl, isn't it lovely to see your friend to see the man again? She was so happy that she could only express herself, with dignity, through the happiness of others. Pearl actually shrieked with joy as she rushed across the room and flung herself into Harold's arms as he stooped to her. He raised her, and she kissed him again and again, and put her little hands all over his face and stroked, very, very gently, his eyes, and said, Oh, I am so glad. And so glad your poor eyes are unbind again. May I call you Harold, too? You darling, was all he could say as he kissed her and holding her in one arm went across and shook hands with Mrs. Stonehouse, who wrung his hand hard. There was a little awkwardness in the group, for none of them knew what would be best to do next. In the midst of it there came a light knock at the door, and Mr. Hilton entered saying, They told me you wished to see me at once, hello. He rushed across the room and took Harold by the shoulders, turning his face to the light. He looked in his eyes long and earnestly, the others holding their breaths. Presently he said, without relaxing his gaze, Did you see Mr. Lee at first? Yes. Seeing at the periphery, but the centre being opaque. Yes. How did you know? Why, I couldn't see, see pointing to Stephen, Lady Delanoy, though her face was right in front of me. Dr. Hilton took his hands from his patient's shoulders and shook him warmly by both hands I am glad, old fellow. It was worth waiting for, wasn't it? But I say, it was a dangerous thing to take off those bandages before I permitted. However, 
it has done no harm. But it was lucky that I mistrusted your patience and put the time for the experiment a week later than I thought necessary. What is it? He turned from one to the other questioningly, there was a look on Harold's face that he did not quite comprehend. HSH said the latter warningly, I'll tell you all about it some time. The awkward pause was broken by Pearl, who came to the doctor and said, I must kiss you, you know. It was you who saved the man's eyes. Stephen has told me how you watched him. The doctor was somewhat taken aback, as yet he was ignorant of Pearl's existence. However, he raised the child in his arms and kissed her, saying, Thank you, my dear. I did all I could. But he helped much himself, except at the very last. Don't you ever go and take off bandages, if you should ever have the misfortune to have them on, without the doctor's permission. Pearl nodded her head wisely and then wriggled out of his arms and came again to Harold, looking up at him protectingly and saying in an old-fashioned way, How are you feeling now? None the worse, I hope, Harold. The man lifted her up and kissed her again. When he set her down she came over to Lady Delanoy and held up her arms to be lifted, and I must kiss you again too, Stephen. If Lady Delanoy hadn't loved the sweet little thing already she would have loved her for that. The door was opened, and the butler announced, luncheon is served. Your ladyship. Asterisk 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 After a few days Harold went over to Varilands to stay for a while with the Stone Houses. Mr. Stone House had arrived, and both men were rejoiced to meet again. The elder never betrayed by word or sign that he recognized the identity of the other person of the drama of whom he had told him and who had come so accidentally into his life, and the younger was grateful to him for it. Harold went almost every day to Lanoy, and sometimes the stone houses went with him, at other times Stephen paid flying visits to Varilands. She did not make any effort to detain Harold, she would not for worlds have made a sign which might influence him. She was full now of that diffidence which every woman has who loves. She felt that she must wait, must wait even if the waiting lasted to her grave. She felt, as every woman does who really loves that she had found her master. And Harold, to whom something of the same diffidence was an old story, got the idea that her reticence was a part of the same feeling whose violent expression had sent him out into the wilderness. And with the thought came the idea of his duty, implied in her father's dying trust, give her time. Let her choose. For him the clock seemed to have stopped for two whole years, and he was back at the time when the guardianship of his boy life was beginning to yield to the larger and more selfish guardianship of manhood. Stephen, noticing that he did not come near her as closely as she felt he might, and not realizing his true reason, for when did love ever realize the true reason of the bashfulness of love, felt a chillness which in turn reacted on her own manner. And so these two ardent souls, who yearned for each other's love and the full expression of it, seemed as if they might end after all in drifting apart. Each thought that their secret was concealed. 
but both secrets were already known to Mrs. Stonehouse, who knew nothing, and to Mr. Stonehouse, who knew everything. Even Pearl had her own ideas, as was once shown in a confidence when they were alone in Stephen's bedroom after helping her to finish her dressing just as Stephen herself had at a similar age helped her uncle Gilbert. After some coy leading up to the subject of pretty dresses, the child putting her little mouth to the other's ear whispered, May I be your bridesmaid, Stephen? The woman was taken aback, but she had to speak at once, for the child's eyes were on her, Of course you will, darling. But I, I may never be married. You. You must. I know someone who will make you. Stephen's heart beat hard and rapidly. The child's talk, though sweet and dear, was more than embarrassing. With, however, the desire to play with fire, which is a part of the nature of women, she answered. You have some queer ideas, little one, in that pretty knowledge box of yours. Oh, he never told me. But I know it all the same. And you know it too, Stephen. This was getting too close to be without danger, so she tried to divert the thought from herself. My darling, you may guess about other people. Though I don't say you ought, but you must not guess about me. All right, then she held up her arms to be lifted on the other's knee and said, I want to whisper to you. Her voice and manner were so full of feeling that somehow the other was moved. She bent her head, and Pearl taking her neck in her little palms, said, I thought, oh, long ago that I would marry him myself. But you knew him first. And he only saved me. But you saved him. And then she laid her head down on the throbbing bosom, and sobbed. And Stephen sobbed too. Before they left the room, Stephen said to her, very gravely, for the issue might be one of great concern. Of course, Pearl dear, our secrets are all between ourselves. Pearl crossed her two forefingers and kissed them. But she said nothing, she had sworn. Stephen went on, and, darling, you will remember too that one must never speak or even think if they can help it about anyone's marrying anyone else till they say so themselves. What is it, dear, that you are smiling at? I know, Stephen. I mustn't he take off the bandage till the doctor says so. Stephen smiled and kissed her. Hand in hand. Pearl chattering merrily, they went down to the drawing room. Chapter XXXAE Golden silence each day that passed seemed to add to the trouble in the heart of these young people, to widen the difficulty of expressing themselves. To Stephen, who had accepted the new condition of things and whose whole nature had bloomed again under the sunshine of hope, it was the less intolerable. She had set herself to wait, as had countless thousands of women before her, and as due proportion will, till the final cataclysm abolishes earthly unions. But Harold felt the growth, both positive and negative, as a new torture, and he began to feel that he would be unable to go through with it. In his heart was the constant struggle of hope, and in opposition to it the seeming realization of every new fancy of evil. That bitter hour, when the whole of creation was for him turned upside down, 
was having its sad effect at last. Had it not been for that horrid remembrance he would have come to believe enough in himself to put his future to the test. He would have made an opportunity at which Stephen and himself would have with the fires of their mutual love burned away the encircling mist. There are times when a single minute of common sense would turn sorrow into joy, and yet that minute, our own natures being the opposing forces, will be allowed to pass. Those who loved these young people were much concerned about them. Mrs. Stonehouse took their trouble so much to heart that she spoke to her husband about it, seriously advising that one or other of them should make an effort to bring things in the right way for their happiness. The woman was sure of the woman's feeling. It is from men, not women, that women hide their love. By side glances and unthinking moments women note and learn. The man knew already, from his own lips, of the man's passion. But his lips were sealed by his loyalty, and he said earnestly, My dear, we must not interfere. Not now, at any rate, we might cause them great trouble. I am as sure as you are that they really love each other. But they must win happiness by themselves and through themselves alone. Otherwise it would never be to them what it ought to be, what it might be, what it will be. So these friends were silent, and the little tragedy developed. Harold's patience began to give way under the constant strain of self-suppression. Stephen tried to hide her love and fear, under the mask of a gracious calm. This the other took for indifference. At last there came an hour which was full of new, hopeless agony to Stephen. She heard Harold, in a fragment of conversation speak to Mr. Stonehouse of the need of returning to Alaska. That sounded like a word of doom. In her inmost heart she knew that Harold loved her, and had she been free she would have herself spoken the words which would have drawn the full truth to them both. But how could she do so, having the remembrance of that other episode, when... Without the reality of love, she had declared her. Oh, 